Words on the program. Yeah, reading the program this morning, I thought you know, it say? was going to be put there. <laughs> um, sorry, it's. Um, I, I was going to keep this short, but uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, so um, as you all know, core ingredients to uh, the reception fund supremacy is exhibiting presumably uh, are of outer space nature, which are hard for classical uh, uh, finite design algorithms, but for which you have quite efficient quantum algorithms. So we're really excited uh, to have Lumesh tell us about recent work on putting this uh, on bridges. Okay. So, uh, so my my charge was exactly to say um, try to say what are the open questions you know what to build up towards the the, the main questions that um, um, you know that that remain open uh, in terms of um, putting quantum supremacy on a rigorous footing. So let me let me try to uh, uh, and and uh, you know I I want to. Uh, uh, so I want to get to the to the questions that are that are really um, uh, at the core of this, and hopefully, uh, you know, some that you can you can tackle without really uh, doing like, too much about quantum. Okay, so um, um, so here were the the here's the backdrop. Um, a couple of years ago, Google uh, announced uh, announced their quantum supremacy experiment based on. You know, there's 52 qubit quantum circuits, uh, depth 20, uh, with gate fidelity about 0.99. Okay, so uh, so that was roughly a thousand gates, each of which failed with probability one in a hundred, which meant uh, these were very noisy outputs that they got. And then uh, last year there was a there you know at the University of Science and Technology in China there were there was an announcement about boson sampling experiment. Which, uh, which was, um, which was uh, effectively a larger Hilbert space of roughly 72 qubits, uh, 76 qubits. Okay, so, um, so now, uh, what, you know, so how, how do we get to understand what quantum supremacy is? So let me just give you a little bit of a backdrop to that and then, okay, so, so what's quantum su supremacy? Well, for the, to understand that, let's just go back to the, the early history of quantum computing. So, so the computer science interest in, in quantum computing really started with this notion that quantum computers violate the extended church string thesis. Now, here's one way to look at it. You know, so so why, is, why is quantum supremacy so important? Well, here's one way to look at it. So the classical description of an n qubit state is, is this... Uh, is this exponential superposition, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a two to the n dimensional complex vector, right? Uh, where each amplitude corresponds to the the amplitude of a particular configuration, a particular n bit string. So and and of course, when we when we measure, we don't get to see the superposition. We get to see almost no information at all. Just just an n bit string. And so for all practical purposes, we could think that, um, you know, that, that, uh, that this quantum state is a black box, that, you know, that, that nature protects her secrets extremely, you know, guards them very closely so that, um, so that um, you know, you might think that, in fact, nature is being so scrupulous about it that there's no way that we could, we could ever, um, uh, experimentally, uh, um, you know, uh, probe and and uh, verify that this that there's this exponentially large Hilbert space. And so, in the you know in the early days of quantum computing, it was it was it wasn't lost on us that 
that once you have a violation of the of, of this extended chair string thesis, you get implicitly a way to a, a way to probe Hilbert space and 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 verify that the Hilbert space was exponentially large. Right. So so for example, you know, we say, well, if you did, if you were able to do this experiment demonstrating an exponential speed up, then you'd have a computational verification that there was an exponentially large Hilbert space. And so, so in fact, you know, quantum supremacy is sort of sort of this this uh, um, you know very jazzy new term, which which uh, for an exp experimental verification violation of this uh, extended chair string thesis. Now, also already, you know, uh, in the early days of quantum computing, it was it was pretty clear what you should do in order to in order to do such an experiment, right? As soon as uh, uh, we had Shor's algorithm. That was, you know, uh, as long as we didn't care about the the actual experimental difficulty uh, involved, you know, because this was the early days, you may as well assume whatever quantum computer you wanted to. Then Shor's algorithm was the natural way to to carry out this experiment because simple simple idea, right? You you input a number, uh, you get the factors from the quantum computer. You multiply them to see if you got back that number, and then you say, "Okay, well, that's it." You know, I, I now, I now know that um, classically it would take an exponential amount of effort to do this, and therefore, I have a, I have a real uh, a verification that behind the scenes there must be an exponentially large object like an like a Hilbert. Okay, now this notion started changing. Uh, around ten years ago, because exper you know because there was a prospect that that experiments would get close enough, right? So now it was you know there were there were back of the envelope calculations saying that if you wanted to do this with factoring, then you would need uh, you know uh, thousands and possibly millions of qubits. You know we are we are, we are, we are, we are just no, going to be nowhere close to that, and so the question was. Could you actually do this without appealing to, to quantum algorithms the, the way we were thinking about it? And so there were, there were two, uh, uh, two proposals that, that, uh, that spoke about how one, one could do this in the near term using, using the kinds of quantum computers one could envision, which would be very noisy. And so these were, these were based on sampling tasks. So, it, you know, where instead of actually solving a computational problem like uh, factoring, you would just, you would just use the uh, quantum computer to sample from some distribution. And so there were two such proposals, one, one due to Aronson and Archipov, uh, both on sampling, and the other due to Brevner, Joza, and Shepard. This was called IQP. Okay, okay so, uh, so, at the end of the day, what do we, what do we want from this uh, from from uh, from this this sort of uh, an experiment? So we want to say, look, um, we have some some device that claims to be quantum, and we are going to collect some statistics from it, and then we are going to we are going to uh, uh, perform some statistical analysis on this on this collected data, and so. Uh, so, so we, we we have some statistical classifier which uh, for which we say, okay, our collected data lies on this side of the line, and then together together with that, we also have have um, some theorem that says any classical device must sit on the other side of the line. Any any classical device that's efficient couldn't possibly have generated data that, that lies on this side of this dividing line. Okay. Um, and so, so, so we have some statistical measure that distinguishes between a quantum device and any classical de device that's efficient. So that, that's what, what the, what the uh, goal of this, of this enterprise is. So, so there are two parts to this enterprise. One is, one is this uh, a statistical measure um, once you get this data, how, how, do you, how do you evaluate it? And the second is some kind of a proof, right? A, a complexity theoretic proof saying that any low complexity classical device must sit on 
one side of this. Okay, so so now where how do these sampling tasks go? So so of course we we knew from the you know early days of quantum computing that that this is what quantum computers are are good for, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, they 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 sample from probability distributions, and you know even the most basic thing you do with them is for a sampling. So so you know that's what that what that what comes very naturally, right? And but there was there's also this sense in which probability distribution generated by quantum circuits look very different from or quantum computers look very different from those generated by classical computers and and you know this was uh, but but uh, um, somehow you know this this uh, this was um, clear in this uh, in this proof that bqp lies in gap p it's the difference uh, you know if you it's you can solve it by solving a counting problem but the kind of counting problem you solve is you take the difference of two, two, uh, two sharp p functions. And the way this comes about is, let's say that you have a quantum circuit C, which, which works on input, say, zero to the n. And now your output is, you know, you run this quantum circuit, and you measure the output, and you see what, what you get. Okay. So now we want, to, we want to understand what's the probability that We'll, we'll actually measure x. Okay, so, so how do we figure this out? Well, what you can do is, what you, what you do, if, if this was a probabilistic uh, sort of circuit, then you would say, well, look at, let's look at all possible computational paths that lead from the input, uh, you know, through all possible branchings, and that eventually output x. And let me, add up the, the, the probabilities of all these parts. So the probability of a part is the product of the, of the branching probabilities along the path. And, and now we just add them. Now the, the point with a quantum computer is that these branching probabilities are actually complex numbers. But in fact, the complex numbers don't matter. All that matters is that you're allowed to have positive and negative numbers. Right? And so when you look at the, 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 the probability to associate with, with a path, it's actually a probability amplitude and it's either positive or negative. And so you'll have, you, if you want to look at the probability of X, what you'll have to do is look at all those paths which give you a positive, uh, um, positive amplitude, all those that give you a negative amplitude and take the, your, your total amplitude is the sum of these two. So it's the, it's a plus minus a minus, and then and then the probability you actually see x is the square of this. And so when you square this, what you will get is actually a plus squared plus a minus squared minus two times a plus a minus. Right? So so this is where you get the difference of two quantities, and you can you can write each of these sums down. You know the positive quantity and the negative quantity. You can just just sum them separately, and you get two sharp p functions. Okay, so so this is the this is a basic difference in a probabilistic circuit computing the probability is in sharp p, quantum circuit computing the probability that you output x is in gap p. And in fact, it's gap p hard for the for worst case uh, circuit C. All right, so 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 far so good. You know, at the, at the time, you know, we just said okay, it's in sharp p. You know, it's 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 slightly different from sharp p. You know, it's in gap p. Okay, but this was really a crucial point, and 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 this was really something that uh, that Aronson Arkhipov and uh, Brevna Joseph uh, Joseph uh, Shepard really uh, noticed that, that that this difference is really quite extremely important once you once you start basing uh, um, you know uh, trying to base uh, um, uh, you know this quantum supremacy on on sampling tasks, and so so why is that? Well, you know the okay. So so sorry. Okay, so so already you know already it was evident that there's a there's a there's a major difference, which is this thing. You know, uh, 
if you want to, if you want, if you look at the probability that that a classical circuit will output X, it's in sharp P. But you can also estimate it with an NP oracle, right? So, so approximating this probability lies in the polynomial hierarchy. But once you are given the difference of two sharp P functions, estimating that difference is still sharp P hump. Right, so, so even though these two look very similar to each other this way, in terms of computing the value, once you go to approximate them, this one is much simpler than that. And so quantum and classical are very far apart once you, once you talk about approximating these probabilities. Now there's a, but, but okay, so, but there's a, there's a crucial step from there, which was, which was a really important, I, I think, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a simple step, but I think it's, it's sort of a very interesting, you know, it's a, it's simple, but not entirely obvious step. Which was which was this? So so what they what Aaron Sinakopov and Rebna Joza Shepard observed, which was really I think quite quite important, is that they said, well, look, suppose that that you have a classical computer that can sample from the output distribution of this of this quantum circuit, or even from a close by distribution. So now you can use Stockmeyer to say, well. If you can sample from the distribution, then you can also approximate this uh, output probability, right? In within the you know within NP oracle, so within the within the polynomial hierarchy. And now, once you've actually approximated this this output probability, you've actually separated these two. So, 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 so. Well, okay, so on, shouldn't, shouldn't we be done? You know, shouldn't we now have a rigorous proof that, uh, uh, you know, that if you, if you solve this, uh, this sampling problem, then you couldn't possibly have done it classically, right? Unless, the, unless uh, you know, uh, uh, unless the uh, sharp, you know, the polynomial hierarchy collapses, you have sharp P being, being approximated inside the, Collapse down to the problem in hierarchy. So the the answer lies in this 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 fact that this is for a worst case set. So so this is for the worst possible input, and who knows what that is. So what we really want to do now is we want to say, actually, it's you know it's uh, it's hard to compute this this output probability or even to approximate it. For a random circuit C. So that's that's the crux of the matter. Okay, so that's how, how this this uh, this one. Um, okay, so uh, so what was the what was the experiment that Google did? It, it actually did exactly this experiment. They, they had a, um, you know, they made out this uh, superconducting qubit uh, for the computer uh, with, uh, you know, these are the qubits, those are the couplers, which, which uh, through which you, you can program the gates. And, and so, so what they did was they fixed a particular sequence of, uh, you know, of set settings. Um, for 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 twenty, uh, uh, you know, for for depth twenty, and so that was your, that was your random circuit C that was fixed. They initialized all the qubits to to zero, and then they they ran the circuit, measured the qubits to get a fifty two bit uh, random string X. Okay, S sample from the, you know, assuming that this was really a quantum computer, then it was it was the output of that quantum computer. Except it was noisy um, and very noisy, right? Because there were a thousand gates, each with one in hundred chance of error. So. Now and then they repeat, right? So uh, for that same random circuit, initialize again. You know, pick another sample and keep doing this. And then, okay. So now, um, 
in order to do their statistical test, they also needed some help. So they said, okay, now let's use a supercomputer to compute what's the probability that X should have been output if this, this device that they had was really this quantum circuit C that they had picked. So that requires an exponential amount of time, but luckily 52 is not that big and they could use some heuristics and so on to work this out. And now they needed to check whether the sample axes were consistent with the corresponding problem. So that was the whole experiment. Okay, so okay, so so there were two challenges, you know, one, how do you design this statistical test? And two, how do we know that approximating this output probability for a random quantum circuit is indeed hard? But, and actually, if we, if we do know that it's hard, then by Stockmeyer sampling, you know, we'd know that sampling from any distribution is constant. distance from from, from this probability distribution is hard. So, so at least we know that, and then we, we need to design a statistical test to check that the constant probability Okay, so, so now let me, uh, let me just briefly talk about what we know about with respect to this, this second question. You know, how do we show, know that it's, it's hard for random uh, quantum circuits or to what extent do we know that? And then a little bit about the statistical test. Okay, so how do we know that uh, approximating this output probability for a random quantum circuit is hard? Well, we want a first case to average case reduction. Uh, Okay, so so the, the first thing they're going to do is we're going to model, they're, they're going to do, have a simple simplifying assumption. We'll assume that, that the random quantum circuit actually implements a power random unit, you know, perfectly random unitary on, on n qubits. So this is something that, um, you know, that appears to be true once, once you get to depth n circuits. Now, of course, well, uh, in the Google experiment, they aren't getting quite as far, but but they they seem to have, uh, um, you know, they experimented with it. It seems it seems like it's a it's a decent assumption. Okay, uh, and then uh, what 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 we what we want to do is we want to model model this worst case to average case reduction after Lipton's permanent reduction. So, so how do you want to do that? Well, let, let me can just I, can I ask a question. That yes, I, I'm sorry for interruption. This is David. David, good morning. Uh, in the uh, there is a borderline trivial argument to show that the random classical circuit is not um, um, is is hard just by counting, right? So, what goes wrong in 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 this case? Because you are bounding the depth. I'm sorry if I missed that. Or or what goes wrong in this case, just a counting argument that if you randomly uh, sample the circuit, then it's just the number of distribution will produce is too much for, for to be computed. Uh, but the, you see, so, so uh, it may be too much to be computed, but, but we are saying, look, uh, you are even given an NP oracle and then a CD, right? So, so we are trying to distinguish quantum from classical in the, in the, in the, in the classical case, you know, we are going through Stockmeyer and saying, well, you know, but once you have an NP oracle, it's easy to compute these things. In the in the quantum case, we want to say it's even hard with with NP oracle. You know, it's it's hard anywhere in the hierarchy. That's that's what we want to really get to. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So. So just, just uh, uh, you know, just to make sure we're on the same page, let me just do a very quick uh, uh, review of you know the way I'm thinking about Lipton's uh, argument, just to get our notation, you know, uh, to match up. So in 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 the permanent case, well, you have some. Uh, you have some matrix A whose permanent you're trying to compute. And so you define this, this uh, 
this other, you know, uh, a, a one parameter family of, of matrices, you pick a pick a random matrix R. And, you know, you, in this case, uh, you're working over a finite field. Um, and so you let A of T be X plus T times R. And now A of T is random uh, for any non-zero T. And then there's this very, you know, and then you observe that permanent of A of T is a degree and polynomial in, in, in T. And so, and, and that what you're really interested in is permanent of A of zero, which is permanent of X. And so, so if, you, if you were to compute uh, the permanent of A of T for N different value, non-zero values of, uh, of T, then these would be N random permanents and in the process, you would have computed <clears throat> which is a which is a non-random. Okay, so I'm I'm going to describe to you what it takes to actually carry out this this sort of thing in the in the context of of well, quantum circuits. Okay. Yeah. So the quantum circuit approximating the R value, you said you need depth m. You you need depth m for a two design. So uh, you know. And then there are, there are results saying even along the way you get you converge towards it. Okay. Of course, you'd, you'd want for her and then you'd want. Okay, but, but uh, you know, but this is the simplifying assumption, and then, you know, and then we we'll just see what we'll Okay, so so let's let's try to put put the pieces together for for such a reduction and see what all we need. But one thing we, that would be uh, you know convenient to have is a polynomial somewhere, right? So uh, you know, and and so what. You know the the first thing you know sort of this is this is sort of the easy thing to say that well your output probability of the quantum circuit is uh, you know if you have a quantum circuit with m gates then you can write it as a as a as a polynomial in the parameters of the circuit right uh, uh, you know so if you if you let the gates be c one through c m then then you can sort of again take a Take uh, sum over all parts, you know. So. Okay. Uh, but now the the place there's a problem with is is if you if you are trying to if you are trying to uh, um, um, you know, uh, somehow, um, uh, you know, uh, reproduce that previous argument, Lipton's argument, then well, we run into a problem straight away because we, we can't take, you know, given a circuit C, we cannot, we cannot sort of take C plus T times R, you know, if this is a unitary and this is a unitary, when you, when you take a linear combination of them, you won't get a unitary. Okay, so, um, so, so how do we how do we sort of go from a circuit to a hard random circuit? Well, there's an easy way to do it. What you could do is choose uh, choose a bunch of hard random gates. So and um, and uh, uh, you know basically replace each gate by that gate followed by a hard random gate. So so that gives you you know if you if you start with any circuit you you'll end up with a circuit which is hard random. So. That, 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 that's 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 right. correct. Uh, okay, but now there's there's nowhere a univariate polynomial structure, right? So which connects this uh, this the circuit we started with with this new random circuit. So so we should do something something different. Okay, so so here's what uh, here's what we can do. So the, the thing we can do, so the, the, the interesting thing in, in, in a quantum circuit um, is that if you can apply a gate, you can also apply the half of that gate, the square root of that gate, or, or any fraction of that gate. And so, so what, we, what we can do is 
Well, we, we won't quite apply this far random gate. We'll just dial it back by a tiny amount. So that's this theta here. So, uh, so if theta equal to one, then then of course uh, we we just dialed it back totally, and so we got back to the original circuit. If theta is zero, then then we totally applied this higher random gate, and so it's you know we're back where we were in the previous slide. But now we'll we'll assume we'll take theta as small, and so now each gate is very close to higher random. And and now we have the single parameter family again, right? Because we use we're, we're going to apply different random random gates for 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 each gate of the of of the circuit, but we'll dial it back by the same amount theta. So this theta is the corresponding parameter to t in the in Lipton's. Right. So now we have a univariate polynomial. Well, oh. So we take a small theta and, and then, then we want to then we want to work with that. Okay, so so, so now there's still a problem. Uh, the problem is that you know this dialing back, you know, this is not a polynomial in theta. And so that's that's of course something that's quite crucial to the uh, best case to average case reduction. So so the solution is to take a truncation of the Taylor series, and now you can get very close, and uh, and, and you do end up with a polynomial in theta, and, and and so you can now now go through the through through uh, so the, the, uh, the template that um, you know that you've for that. Okay, so. Uh, um, now, of course, when when you when we do this truncation, it introduces a small error. It turns out that there's a different way of doing this, which is a little bit more complex. But it's, uh, you know, this is uh, what Mubasar uh, did. He showed that, in fact, there's a different way to do this, where you use a use a Cayley path interpolation, and you know, which which actually stays unitary throughout, so you don't even need this this small error. Okay, so um, so all right. So so uh, now um, let me let me talk about the error that uh, you know how robust this uh, you know so so this gives us a reduction, but but we have to talk about how robust it is. Um, actually, while talking about the robustness, I'll actually talk about the recent improvement that was that was done by. Uh, Two groups there, Gulan, Sakram, and Bandar, and Okay, so so how, how do we understand that? So we we you know we should understand that in terms of polynomial interpolation, and this is over the real. So so what are we doing? Well, um, well we have some small interval. You know, within which theta is allowed to uh, to sit, and uh, we we want we 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 chose theta to be very small. You know, with a small perturbation, and of course, where we want to go out to is 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 theta equal to one. That's that's where the worst case circuit sits. So this is where we collect the data, and. Uh, Okay, so the range in which we collect the data is so we let this this interval be of of uh, of size one over m. The m is the total number of gates, right? Because because these are going to add up, and that that's that's where we want these to sit. What we'll collect is about m squared samples, you know, for, of equally equally uh, spaced thetas. And now we are going to assume that at least two thirds of these samples that we pick are delta close to, to the actual value that, that we were supposed to get. Right? So, so we are assuming that this, this uh, quantum computer is noisy 
one third of the time it might just give us complete nonsense but two thirds of the time it gives us something that's an approximation to what the true value is if you were to use the true quantum circuit and now of course uh, you know with this noisy interpolation that would be hard but remember we have an empty oracle so we, we don't need to sweat that and so we'll just find the polynomial and now we need to bound how far away we are. Okay, so, uh, so, um, so on the, you know, in our in the in the previous paper, what we had shown was that that uh, that that uh, you would uh, uh, that uh, that that you would be within delta, which is which is how close these samples were. That would get amplified by exponential in m times beta. Beta was this, which was one over m, so n squared. But uh, but you know, ideally, you want you want to choose delta to be roughly two to the minus n. So we really have to improve this a lot. So that's that's what these people do. They they actually improve this to order m times uh, two to the order m times log of beta in x, which is order m log. But as you can see, order m log m is still not good enough, right? So one, you want it to be linear, right? Because because you want to say, well, this distance, you know, how bad, you know. So eventually, we want to say, well, the worst case circuit is, you know, the output probability is hard to approximate to within within how much? Well, we want delta to be sort of uh, sort of small there, right? We want to say, well, within constant factor, it's hard to approximate or something. So certainly, we want delta to be you know, of you know, two to the order minus order n. So certainly we can't afford these log m factors here, but even worse, we can't afford m here, it should be n, right? M was the number of gates in the circuit. So it was n times d, where d, d is a depth. We really want two to the minus n. So this is really, uh, you know, it's it's a crucial thing that one one has to has to improve for these results to be robust. Um, actually, the the improvement to get down to m log m is really quite nice. You know, the idea is to substitute theta as x to the k. So you you sort of uh, uh, focus your attention on this this interval, and what that does is it leaves leaves the endpoints unchanged, but now beta goes to beta to the one over k, and, and so if you choose k to the log m log m. That becomes m log m and m to the one over m. So, so it, it sort of focuses the, the um, your results in the right way. Uh, now, the, the situation is much nicer for boson sampling because there, um, I'll, I'll just go over this very quickly, uh, but uh, let me just give you, a, give you a sense of it. So, you have n bosons, n squared modes. Uh, the degree of the polynomial is going to be n, but the dimension of the Hilbert space that you're working in, you know, they, these are n bosons in n squared mode. So you get this, uh, um, you know, it's this uh, balls and bins, uh, right? These are identical particles. So it'll be the, the, um, the dimension of the Hilbert space would be n squared plus n minus one n, n log n. So it's, it's as though, you know this n log n is the is the is the is the important parameter here, and so we we uh, you know we we don't mind uh, uh, delta being one over you know two to the n log n, and of course m you know this m was now now n that's the degree of the polynomial so so everything seems fine except for the constants up here, and so. So for boson sampling, this this result is within within a constant of six or eight of being being meaningful. So so there it's it's not clear that there's any fundamental barrier to just charging ahead and, and improving it to the point where it actually gives you a meaningfully robust result. Is it like, uh, the delta exponential? Well, because because. Uh, you, you know, uh, you you expect the probabilities to be roughly uniform, right? And then, then you, you want them to be there.
Okay, so I'll try to say just spend another five, ten minutes just wrapping up at the second time. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, I find a statistical test to check whether the sample axes are consistent with this is uh, observed to be uh, with, with the theoretical you know probabilities of generating x so so the measure that was eventually used uh, in the google experiment was linear cross entropy which is just the expected value of for of, of uh, so so in other words you 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 uh, you actually measure x you compute p sub c of x and now you now you now you compute the sample average of that so you're, you're, you're coming up with an approximation for the expected value of p sub c of x. So initially, they started with a different different measure, which was linear, which was cross entropy, which would have been expected value of uh, minus log of p sub c of x, and that that also is is actually quite interesting. I can say a little bit about that. But but when they ran the experiments, this one did better, and it's it turns out it's it's a, it's also a good. A very good uh, um, um, and the intuition is, well, you know, this the output distribution is not going to be uniform. It's actually exponentially distributed, and so it's almost uniform. But but there are some, you know, some strings are somewhat higher probability than others, and uh, and now you would expect the higher probabilities outputs to show up more often. And therefore, this expected value of p sub c of x should be should be larger than one over two to them. Right? This is what it would be if it was completely flat. And in fact, if you work it out, then for a random quantum circuit, this expected value is exactly twice what it would be if it was uniform. You know, it's two over two to them. Okay. So, so well, when they when they ran the experiment. You know, the, the, the estimate was 1.002 over 2 to the n, which uh, they said, well, this is larger than 1 over 2 to the n, therefore it must be one. Actually, they, they did a little more than that. They said, well, look, uh, this, this is pretty, uh, um, you know, it seems, it seems like, uh, you know, this is only a small signal. How do we know it's a, this is really a signal and not noise? And so they repeated this this experiment thousands of times, and tried to. You know, well, there's there's some some justification for this, but where where, where do the does do these justifications come from? Well, uh, various things. But let me show you um, uh, uh, one one particular way of of justifying this uh, again. And uh, okay, so. Uh, so this notion that typically you will see, you know, you're you're more likely to see heavy outputs than light outputs. So this was formalized by Aronson and Chen uh, in this in this, uh, this uh, uh, challenge, you know, Hall, which says, well, you're given a random quantum circuit C. Can you generate several samples x1 to xk so that at least two thirds of them have a probability? Larger than median. So if you if you look at the parameters of this exponential distribution that you get, uh, this is you know the, your quantum circuit will satisfy this. And this seems like a real challenge to come up with. Yes. What role does the parameter k play in this talk? Uh, what role would the yeah? So so it would it would. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, okay, so uh, you you could um, I, I think then you know you can you can define sort of a dual problem which I'll which I'll do down here, and then if you want them to correspond to each other, you 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 work with the trade off between k. So let let me let me just. Uh, uh, Maybe let's let's see what what it would be out here, right? So so um, once once you move on to linear cross entropy, you you actually have to 
you know think about this slightly differently so there's a there's a corresponding version of of this heavy output generation which which really deals with uh, um, you know it's, it's more quantitative and for now the challenge is uh, uh, you're given a, a random quantum circuit C you want to you want to generate a bunch of samples such that the average of uh, the average probability of this uh, of, of the string in the sample under the circuit C is is at least one plus b times two to the n two to the minus n. So it's 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 larger than the than the expected probability by by this small amount. And so this is exactly the kind of uh, kind of problem that you know this is this is almost exactly a, a translation of the actual experiment right except that except that in the actual experiment well was was the deviation uh, from 1 over 2 to the n was it was it some constant or 1 over polynomial times 2 to the minus n or was it actually more like 1 over 2 to the n where m was the number of gates Right. And I, you know, that that's that's the one thing that one has to worry about. But to, within that that distinction, n versus m distinction, which is which is a source of many problems here and something that we have to think through. But but this is this is a direct translation up to that. And then you can you can come up with another come up with a conjecture, which is uh, in the. You know, you could you could think of it as some sort of exponential time hypothesis for or a type of it for quantum circuits. You know, uh, so it's sort of going out on the limb and assuming a lot of thing. But there's no polynomial time algorithm that on on input a random quantum circuit C. Now you want to you want to understand with what probability does this random circuit output the all zero string. So produces an estimate for p zero, which is the probability that the circuit output zero to the end. With the with with the following minimal requirement, so we want to produce an estimate, which is just slightly better than the trivial estimate. So the trivial estimate would be would be you would say p sub c, you know, the, that p zero must be two to the minus n. Okay, so all you want is to beat that by a little bit. In the following sense, you want that the you know that the that the expect expected square deviation from t you naught know, should be should be slightly smaller than if you had guessed two to the minus seven. So you look at the expected square deviation here, and you just want to beat it by some some other exponentially smaller one. And now you can you can actually show with various parameters that that. Uh, this assumption actually implies that uh, that uh, you know that 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 you couldn't possibly have carried out this task classically, and therefore, if a device manages to do this, it must have been quantum. And basically, the way you do that is first you 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 say, well, in these quantum circuits, you could you could always have either flipped or not flipped every output bit. So whether you're looking to for this probability for the string zero to the n or some other string, it's all the same. So you may as well replace this zero, the all zero string by a completely random string. Because you see, because this, this, this uh, you know, okay, so we want to show, show x quad implies this. So you say, well, if there's an algorithm for this, there's an algorithm for this. But the algorithm for this maybe, you know, who knows, you know, it may be producing strings in a, in a particular way so that it never produces zero to the n. So, so the, the, the way we'll, we'll do this estimation is, uh, is we want to say, okay, so we'll first say our task is to figure this out for a random string. And then, and then the algorithm would be, well, we just, we just run this, this algorithm, the, the, the presumed algorithm for x log, and then, and then just see if, if, if this random string occurs in, this, in these outputs, we'll say, oh yeah, it has high, higher probability. Otherwise, it's same as one over two to that. Right, so 
So you say, well, it, it must have probability one, one over b times two to the minus n. Otherwise, you say it's it's uh, it's zero. It's one over two. And then you just apply some sort of Markov inequality to say that's it. Uh, okay. So I should uh, I should really uh, uh, wind up here. So let me just uh, just say uh, a, a little bit about about all this. So. Um, so, so there, there's this one issue that I said is, is really quite important. It's the number of qubits versus the number of gates for random circuit sampling. You know, as we saw, uh, we really need to uh, not, not just get rid of this log m factor, but also do this m versus n thing. Uh, it, it actually shows up also in this in this uh, in this. Uh, or fourth uh, kind of argument, you know, this n versus m issue is really, um, and it's a it's an interpretation thing, but they're actual experiments. Um, I should also say that, um, um, you know, I, you know, as I mentioned, there, there's there's also uh, also um, uh, instead of linear cross entropy, you could be looking at cross entropy itself, and then. For that measure, you know, it's possible to show that uh, that uh, in fact, you know, if you if you see the right measure, you know, the right kind of uh, uh, output on the on the on the cross entropy measure, then then in fact, um, um, uh, you know, you are within the within within total variation distance so much of the of the given distribution. So so. Um, uh, you know, so that that ties the the, the cross entropy measure to to this uh, worst case to average case reduction, but un, under under a certain assumption, and the assumption is that um, if you look at your your quantum computer, um, then then the output entropy that it puts out is at least as large as the output entropy of the this the quantum circuit that you were trying to simulate. So you, you you had in mind you know you thought you were programming in a, a quantum circuit C, and on input all zero to n there's there's some output uh, uh, distribution which has some entropy. Now we're saying well whatever this this uh, this uh, the the quantum computer in the lab is you know the out, its output distribution has at least as high entropy. Of course that's a reasonable assumption in the sense that it's a noisy quantum computer, but but uh, you know it doesn't follow, so it's uh, but, but, uh, but, um, okay. So that that's something that um, that uh, that that is a consequence of Pinsker's inequality. Now I, I should say that there's there's a whole other way of doing these uh, uh, these kinds of uh, experiments through you know using cryptographic schemes, but uh, you know but but for those to be uh, to kick in, you know the the um, the specifications of these these quantum computers people are building will have to improve somewhat, both in terms of number of qubits and the and the fidelity of the qubits. So, um, depending upon how optimistic you are, you could say, well, you know, maybe we'll get there in the next next couple of years or or not. But uh, but but I would say that uh, in terms of in terms of proving the robustness of these these uh, these bounds, which uh, you know, which don't uh, which which are for these um, these um, experiments that don't rely on on cryptography, I think that not only is it, is it relevant for the near future, but um, but it's also going to be relevant uh, you know later because because uh, you know. Um, I, I think that there, are, you know, at the end of the day, there, there, are, there, are, there are two or three motivations for for all this work. One is, you know, it's a it's a very important scientific experiment in the sense that you're looking into Hilbert space and you're saying, well, we are verifying something about Hilbert space which which isn't a priori. You know, we won't have thought it's possible to verify. And moreover, you know, it's it's something that um, that we should feel obliged to do because it's such a you know what? What a you know? It's it's such a um, 
uh, you know, such an important, you know, sort of it, it's 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 claiming so much about what's what uh, nature is doing. So we should be verifying it. Another reason to do it is, um, you know, it's a it's a step on the way to to building better quantum computers, and in particular, these techniques have, are are being used to benchmark quantum computers, and I don't think that's going to go away. So, so uh, I think uh, uh, you know, even if we have these other schemes for for supremacy uh, proofs of quantumness, it's not you know the, these earlier things are still going to be of of interest. So. Thanks so much for agreeing to bring some quantumness into our workshop. Uh, I have a hopelessly naive question. So, you know, for sampling tasks, we have canonical classical types of algorithms, Markov chain Monte Carlo type algorithms. Is there, uh, okay, and one thing that we have a lot of people here who are interested in is proving unconditional lower bounds on such algorithms for supposedly hard problems. Um, is there some canonical a uh, classical family of algorithms that one would use if uh, there were, if this problem were easy, that one could study unconditioned to, to prove unconditional lower bounds against. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, so um, for for these, you know, there are there are a few classes of algorithms one could look into. You know, one is of course. Um, um, just the Feynman path integral, which is just another, you know, for, for us, it's another name for, what, what would you call it? Where you just uh, just look at all computational paths. It's, uh, I'm sorry? Maybe, I'm, I'm sorry? Matrix multiplication. Um, yeah, but for, for a general computation, right? Um, okay. Uh, um, another, another set of techniques would involve uh, tensor networks, right? You try to you try to break up the quantum circuit in some ways, and, right? so uh, and um, um, <coughs> I mean those, those techniques, you know, those, those techniques were actually used in in uh, you know so so they were brute force computations up to a certain end for computing piece of C of X, and then beyond that there were you know, there were tensor network techniques, and actually, there's a the there, there's even a a paper now about spoofing the uh, the Google experiment, which uh, you know, which which relied on a very clever uh, observation about uh, about uh, you know. So in uh, in your in your worst case to average case reduction, you put a, a a random unitary in between each layer of the circuit. Yeah. And I was a little confused because if if we already believe that the circuit that the entire circuit is in essence a random unitary. Why didn't we just no no multiply we, 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 we didn't uh, oh, oh why why did we why did we uh, uh, so, so, the, so the model seems to be that a circuit is a no no so so sorry um, okay may, maybe I maybe I maybe I didn't make this clear so what we are starting with is you know we we, we are starting from the the the, the point where I said look. Uh, if you wanted to compute uh, the output probability for for a quantum circuit, in the worst case, it's hard for gap theory, right? And even approximating it is hard, whatever, right? So, so okay, so we we start from that that point. Now that gives us a quantum circuit. Right? That's that's where the hardness sits. Now we want to do a worst case to average case reduction. So we start with that circuit, and now we insert random gates in there. So now we have randomized the circuit, right? And now this random distribution we want to claim is the hard distribution, right? So that, this, this is sort, sort of the simplifying assumption. 
right? but we are going from a worst case circuit to to a random circuit and then and then we're saying well look uh, in the experiment we are just picking a random circuit so what do we care it's this one or that one so all the same but so those h sub i's were like random two qubit yeah it's okay good yeah. that's that's what i didn't understand right. Right. It is maybe a bit of a stupid and orthogonal question, but related a bit to the answer to the Sam's question. So something that bothers me a bit here, the so if we're convinced that there's no that you cannot so we said that if we can do if we can solve these problems in polynomial time, uh you know, uh then we would convince we have uh quantum supremacy. But the thing is that what we're doing is we're solving them for a problem of size 52, and we're solving only or Google is solving them for problem size 52 and also only approximately, right? So there's lots of other parameters here, right? You can get, you know, the, the, the edge that you get. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the last. There's edge. lots of other parameters here other than the size, like the edge that you get, like you don't, because yeah, we don't, yeah, that you get the edge, because you don't get, you, we don't solve it exactly. We only yeah. solve it approximately. We get yeah, some yeah. edge over oh, random oh, sampling, yeah, right? Yeah, so we only get it with a small edge. And it seems, like two, you know, 52 is not such a, you know, two to the 52 doesn't, is that such a large number, but then when you get, since we only get an edge, it seems, oh, maybe I can do it in two to the 30, which is something, I don't know, I can do on my watch or something. Is there a way to quantify, like, what we should be, you know, based on maybe a stronger assumption about how, you know, what, what kind of edge and for what size problem would convince us that really this is yeah, not something so... we can do with the uh, class computation? Right, so so I think that was that was the point of these, uh, you know, this, um, uh, um, you know, what I referred to as uh, sort of the analog of the exponential time hypothesis, right? Uh, this thing saying saying that, well, if you have a quantum circuit, you now you're trying to uh, trying to estimate the 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 probability with which it it outputs a certain string, mm -hmm. and and the and the and this assumption that you know that uh, Ernst and Gunn make, uh, you know, which it's a hypothesis that they're making, right? Uh, but but they're they're saying there's no algorithm that will that will give you an edge of one over three to the n. Okay, so I missed that edge is not a parameter. It's not a poly edge. It's an actual. Yeah, it's an actual thing saying you 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 okay. know you you would imagine that okay, okay we're going to compute this yeah. probability but no you know and it's yeah. close to one over two to the end but right but you can't even get but we're not getting that edge yeah and and uh and but but um you know but the thing that uh the i and and so um you know that seems like a you know so so far we don't know of an algorithm that achieves that even that that small small amount it's uh, you know, it's a bold conjecture, but it's, and then the question is, is it bold enough, right? Should it be one over three to the N or should it, should it be one over three to the M or one, one over something to the M, you know? So, so if you use Feynman path integrals, you can, you can get an edge of something, which, which is exponential in M. But now if you dial it back just a little bit and say, okay, you know, I know you can do it using, using these brute, this brute force technique, you can get an edge of this much. But try to get me even anything even slightly larger as a function of n, right? And now one could, you know, one could go out on the limb completely and say, well, you, you can't even do that. And then, well, if you if you make that assumption, then then yes, you would you would say, okay, yes, we should uh, maybe this was, um, you know, uh, one would have to check, but maybe one would say, okay, well, maybe maybe just this small signal was good enough. But then, then you have to go back and say how how confident are we that we you know there's no no technique to get us down, right? So, well, these things seem to require two to the n an exponential number of samples. Okay. Oh, sorry. sorry, so so are are you, are you saying in order to do this uh, you had to you had to choose exponentially many samples? Well, I guess I was confused about the X class thing because oh. the, the probability of getting a particular output on average is one over two to the N. And so most of the time you could say zero. No, no, no. But you're in X class, you're not you're not saying you're you're just giving an estimate of the amount. So you can you 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 want to say so you want to give a number P. I see. Right. So you're looking at the circuit and 
you're analyzing it, and then your, your, your challenge is to output a number. And for example, one number you could output is two to the minus seven without even looking at the circuit. Right, right, right. And you'd, do, you'd, get, you'd, get, you know, you'd get whatever score you do on this. And now your challenge here is to beat that trivial you know, answer by just this much. I, I guess where I was confused is that one way to attempt to solve these problems is if it turns out that there is a classical box which produces outputs with the same probability distribution as the quantum box, then one type of algorithm for these problems is to just sample from that many times. But that's well, not actually the regime we're thinking about here, right? I mean, no, but uh, but but uh, no, that's that's a. I, I think it's okay to think that way. But then, at that point, what you would say is, well, if there's such a classical box, then you arm yourself with the power of NP, and then you then you arm yourself with Stockmeyer, and you say, okay, well, uh -huh. now I can now now I can go to the races with this. So then we strengthen X class to say there's nothing in the polynomial hierarchy that can do that. Uh, you know, so 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 eventually, I, I yeah, I, maybe maybe that's a that's that's a way to go with it. But but I think this is this is just sort of saying, look, uh, it's it's just it's just taking aim at it directly and saying, look, uh, um, you know, uh, did you have a classical algorithm or not? Well, if, if you did, it looked like this, and if you couldn't do this estimate, then you couldn't have pre. It was a just a direct implication. Thank you.